I believe that any intense experience can induce a high superior to the highs which come from imbibing chemicals. My brain naturally produces testosterone, dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, adrenaline, etc. And these hormones produce the feelings that I think most people are trying to simulate by getting high. But unlike with drugs, it requires a huge amount of physical, mental and emotional effort to stimulate all of the feel-good hormones. For example, if you get into awesome shape and train yourself to have the capability for acts of sex and violence, you will feel more testosterone. If you play poker with your friends, you will feel the effects of dopamine. If you build the close relationships with friends and family, you will feel oxytocin. If you exercise, you will feel endorphins. If you do things you are afraid to do, you will feel adrenaline. Let's see the Sadhguru's version of getting blissed out, ecstatic, intoxicated and orgasmic. Sexuality or sex is an inadequate activity to be described as an orgasm. It's inadequate. It is just that when physically one reaches a certain state of ecstasy, there is a limitation. But once one knows how to be orgasmic without the need of the physicality, then it's a perpetual orgasm. In India, we have a better word for this. We call this ananda. Ananda is orgasmic. We described God as an orgasm. We said God is Ananda, Brahmananda. So when we say Brahmananda, what we are saying is, what you refer to as God is an ultimate orgasm. If you are sincere enough to look at life without the conditionings of uh, the wasted religious processes, essentially the only thing that a human being is looking for is ultimate state of pleasantness. He calls it kingdom of God, he calls it heaven, he calls it whatever. Essentially he is looking for uh, an ultimate orgasm. He is not losing, looking for anything else. So God has been described as ananda or God has been described as orgasm. Orgasm is not a sufficient word. Ananda is, a, is saying that thing in a much bigger way than the word orgasm says it. So in the East we called God as ananda. Ultimate orgasm is God. If you want to settle for limited things, you can try sexuality, alcohol, drug. It will only enslave you, it doesn't liberate you. Because this is not ananda, this is just pleasure. Pleasure is always entangling. People seek pleasure essentially because joy is missing, because bliss is missing. If you are blissful, you would definitely not seek pleasure. Pleasure, isn't it so? If you are right now really blissful, would you seek pleasure? Pleasure is just a shadow of blissfulness. It can… it is never the real thing. It just gives you a shadow. But when you have not known the real thing, even a shadow will do. I am not against it, but if you do not realize the limitation of pleasure, you will get entangled in it. The, de the more and more you seek pleasure, the more and more you get entangled to the objects of pleasure. But the more and more blissful you become, the more and more you become free from everything. When you are truly blissful, nothing is needed. No food is needed, no sleep is needed, even life is not needed. Actually, 
when you are truly blissful, you are willing to die. Please see this. Only one, only that one who is constantly willing to die every moment of his life, only that one will know life. Because if you do not know how to fall into the abyss of life, you will never know the peak of life. Life is one inside the other, that's the problem. But people think one is against the other because they are using their logical mind to decipher life. Life and death are one inside the other. Are they one after another? They are not one after another, they are one inside the other, please see. And only if you fall into, willing to fall into that abyss of death, you will know the peak of life. Generally, in English language, if you are in a hopeless condition, we say, it is said in English, you are falling into a bottomless pit. Please understand this, look at the… look at the superficial nature of people's understanding. If a pit is bottomless, there is really no danger, isn't it? It is the most wonderful thing. If something is bottomless and you fall into it, it is an eternal free fall. <laughs> Only because there is a bottom, there is a problem. <laughs> Once it happened, Shankar and Pillai fell off the second floor. And he was hurt. People gathered around him and asked, did the fall hurt you? He said, you idiots, it's not the fall, it's the stopping <laughs> It's never the fall, it's always the stopping which hurts you, isn't it? <laughs> of the many names that Shiva is referred to, Soma is one of the important names. Soma literally means uh, intoxication. If there is no intoxication, you will never be mad enough to jump into the ultimate void, <laughs> which is only liberation. So, Soma or Soma Sundara is one of prominent names of Shiva. Always in everything, but fully alert. So, the story goes like this. Shiva was sitting near Kailash, in a completely inebriated state. The news spread all over India that there is a man sitting, so magnificent a man that slowly year after year, year after year, people started making the pilgrimage. There was a girl who was a princess in the Himalayan kingdom. Her name was Parvati and when she heard this, she said, I want to go and see him. The moment she set her eyes upon him, she just so completely overwhelmed by him. She said, if I marry, I marry only this man. Then somebody else played a conspiracy and he decided to get married. A big wedding was organized, anybody who is anybody is there. The bride is all decked up, everybody is waiting for the groom to come. And the groom came, Shiva walked in, ash smeared, dreadlocked, fully inebriated. And all his friends, these goblins and demented beings making all kinds of noises. Parvati's mother Meena saw this man and his friends. And when she thought that her daughter is going to marry this man, 
she just fainted and fell. Then they revived her and she was completely heartbroken. How can I give my daughter to this man? He's wild. He's completely uncivilized. <laughs> he's not even a man, he's something else. So Parvati went and begged Shiva, for me, whichever way you are, for some reason you put on a hideous form and come, this is also okay with me. But for my mother's sake, just saw a better form. Then he said, okay. And then he turned into a very graceful and beautiful form, which was referred to as Soma Sundara, drunk but beautiful, completely inebriated, eyeballs up, but he became utterly beautiful. Then Meena revived and looked and looked at this magnificent man standing there and she said, I would like to give my daughter to this man, not to that one. So, inebriation, intoxication is an essential quality of meditativeness. If that's not there, if you're not drunk, how can you just sit? It was the most torturous thing, simply sitting there like this, trying to concentrate on something. So that's his essential quality. So he carried the moon, that's a symbolism, that he is always drunk upon himself, no substances. So when we said, Shiva constantly drank Somarasa, he was not an alcoholic, he just imbibed the moonbeams which he carried always in his hair and constantly drunk. This blissful state is not a goal by itself. These blissful states eliminate the fear of suffering. Only when the fear of suffering is gone, only when this idea, what will happen to me, is completely eliminated from you, you would dare to explore life, otherwise you only want to protect it. Whether a career or a business, it's all about security. Marriage is about security, everything is about security. As long as the fear of suffering is constantly playing its role, now you will not dare to really go into deeper dimensions of life. Only if you are drunk like this, but fully alert. Now, there is no fear of suffering, you're willing to go anywhere. 